Welcome to Shiny Side Out with Dave. And Mickey. <laughs> awesome. We're broadcasting from Australia for Revolution Radio on www.you guessed it revolution.radio where it's more than just radio so jump into the chat room if you can this is show number and goodness me 367 760 and 300 100, 100. nice reverb it's on air online and on your smart device so grab an app to listen anywhere or listen at home on a grace tabletop digital radio if you missed Solaris's show, she tonight had... Welcome Jeff. to Shiny Side Out with Dave. Oh, oh, that, that was my mecca. Uh, that's uh, my audio. Um, uh, Jeff Woolwine talking about petroglyphs in the sky. And that's it was right. a co-host, Willie Miranda from Paradigm Matrix as well, was on. Awesome. That's just fantastic. Um <clears throat> It only costs $5.95 Australian per month to access the archives at the freedomslips.com. Uh, so you can pick up her shows, everyone's shows, not just ours and not just hers. At the archives, do that and do the station a favor because it runs totally ad free. And I, but I, I've had uh, Extendivite ad now. So, um, but that's that well it's all needed everything's needed please donate and uh if you're on the website click on the ads every once in a while it doesn't hurt you and it all goes towards supporting the station you can donate money to the station if you wish and you can also buy merch and the merch you can get from the station also contributes towards the running of the station and both mecky and i have our own merch as well shiny side out have its own merch so. oh no we are, make, we are making millions on that every, millions Millions of, of rupees. And of rupees. Make any money. We're no making, money at all. No, no one buys it. So, <laughs> uh, you know, it, we will a million percent more than we currently get is what we're hoping for. And that we currently get zero. So, a million <laughs> times zero is still zero for all those <laughs> mass fiends out there. We acknowledge, Mekki and I, we acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land. We prefer not to say owners because who really owns anything? No one. We're all visitors they're, they're, here. They're Rothschilds, the Rothschilds, they own everything. So just in case you're wondering, so the Rothschilds, they want, they, they want to own everything. They own, they own everything. Oh, everything. pretty much everything. They own you. They own me. That's 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 a given. That's enough, right? <laughs> Is that enough? <laughs> that's enough. I, I'm sure I was written to zero a long time ago. Okay, so uh, where I live, the traditional custodians of the land are the Darkenyung, and where Meki lives, it's the Daruk or Darak. People, oh, yes. I, like to, I, like, I like to say that. That's me. You know, when you say it, I, I have a hard time, and I actually wrote a G there. Is it a D or a G? G. A G. D A R U G. Daruk or Daruk. Ah, that's cool. I've corrected my spelling here now so I can say it properly. Um, and I can, I, I can roll my R's just as effectively. And we pay our respects to elders past, present and future. And let us remember that beneath our feet are lands that have been, um, had stories told about them for at least 240,000 generations in this current evolution of humans. It's going back further and further though. Every, yeah. every, almost every, every month there's, there's another story pushing it back further. But yeah, that's right. Yeah. Look, look, we're talking about possibly millions of years. And I think that's that's very important for us to remember that. Um, uh, where do I start, Mickey? I, the thing that I want to talk about... At the beginning! And, <laughs> <laughs> first the Earth cooled, then the dinosaurs came. <laughs> if you're an airplane fan or flying high as it was everywhere else on the planet, uh, you'll know what I mean. Um, I really, I had a lot of conversations this week about freedom of speech. And I, I think it's really important for all of us to remember 
what it means to have freedom of speech and what that does for us. So that you easily put, uh, you're able to understand the limits and extents of our own moral compasses. Freedom of speech allows us this pleasure. It allows the civilization itself to evolve and to go unified into places in the, you know, of, of it on its own. It does this by being exposed to different things. It sets the place in our minds where, where we are comfortable. That's what our moral compasses do for us. And it does collectively for a nation and for a civilization. Okay, because remembering back in Rome, just remembering this, uh, in its simplest form, casting Christians to the lions was a thing that people watched. Right? Would we do that today? No. I expect we wouldn't do that today. Why? Because of the slow and effortless change of our moral compasses driven by what, what we're exposed to. So sometimes these boundaries are moved away or they're moved closer. And sometimes our center is shifted within our own moral boundary. Does it make sense? I hope it makes sense, Mickey. Our experiences in and in particular today, the published media and social media challenge our morals daily, or maybe even hour by hour, depending on what's occurring. Now, our morals survive by being challenged. And it's our best strength that we have are our morals, and it, it needs to be confronted so that we can make a decision. So it makes, I hope I'm making sense, right? Now, compare your morals to your parents' morals. Can you see a difference? I mean, I, I expect you do. And, and, I, and in my little example about the Christians to the lions, and that was just a thing people did and they, they accepted that. We couldn't accept that today, right? Watching people being torn apart by lions and eaten. I expect that wouldn't wouldn't fare very well. So I'm asked all the time, where do I draw the line? I mean, do I believe all of the conspiracies? And and what do I think about JFK and the moon landings? Usually it's the first two things that come up. But what I my first response is I let people know that they should swap out the word conspiracy for research straight away. So do I believe all of the researchers in the world? And I said, only then, if they swap that word out, will they understand how I've, I lean in the particular direction I lean in, or maybe the other way or another and more importantly how my view can change if new information is presented so we live dynamically at the forefront of the research and that's what i try to tell people and i said okay well i'm gonna answer your question first up jfk right i don't think lee harvey oswald killed kennedy and i'll tell you why since the physics of the kill shot is not consistent with the shooter's position. That phrase is my... Sorry, it, it's, it's not consistent with reality as we know it. <laughs> <laughs> right? But I'm taking it to a physics, science, the science of the kill shot isn't, is not consistent with the shooter's position. Rather than the jury who hears a single bullet, the magic bullet was Lee harvey oswald because that thing is it's a magic bullet it's impossible but the jury decided that that was what it was how could they come to that determination because they were only given evidence in a specific vector and that's all they were allowed to believe so the rear projected fragment suggests and i'm not going to go into too much description a front left uh from jfk's point of view shooter at ground level 
this means that the uh, LHO, uh, Lee Harvey Oswald, was not the killer. That's simple. I didn't have to tell you very much. And with that amount of information, you can easily yourself determine the same outcome. I don't care who it is. I'm just saying it wasn't LHO. And they go, oh, what about 9-11? And all I need to say is Building 7. And they go, why do you say that? What is Building 7? <laughs> they say 80 steel columns failed simultaneously. And only in the basement. It fell in its footprint. It resembled a demo. And even the owner advised he told them to pull it. Outside of the money, just the physics of the collapse is sufficient for me to question it. And, and this is the reason why, Mekki, and you do the same thing, I know this. What we do is we try to get people to think about it. And I know they don't have time. And I know they don't care. But this is what, and I'll take it back to the media and social media. They're challenging our our moral compasses and swaying us and driving us and taking us places but you have to ask for what reason and is the, is the reason apparent probably not but what does it do it gets someone's it's to someone's advantage and that someone could be a, a business a company it could be an individual it could be an overall scheme of things that's a, a future event to occur that we're already emotionally connected to an image that we've seen so that the next time we see or confronted with that thing we've got a an emotional connection of which we're going to answer to the negative we don't want that thing to happen again that's terrible so in the end uh, the events of last week i'm not even going to say the words we've seen gun control even semi-automatic weapons have been banned in that country in the same week within a week all right and with in australia as a result of the same event we've seen our government for the first time that we're aware of for the first time, ban websites to the Australian people. Live Leak website is now offline to Australians, unless you're running a VPN popping up somewhere else in the planet. 4chan, offline, unless you're running a VPN, same as 8chan. Now, 4chan was where QAnon started, 8chan is where it went. Is there something bigger here? Because those websites were discussing uh, a lot of connections with last week's or the week before's events. And it raised too many questions for me. And it began a line of research of which if you hold a copy of that video that was live streamed, 10 years in jail. If you transmit it, make it available for other people to get it. 14 years jail for doing so for sharing it yeah uh, this is something else I, and we've not seen we've not seen punishments directly related to a video that i can remember so to, to to be to be clear though it's it's a video <clears throat> of what you described earlier you know, mm -hmm. having christians being torn apart by lions so this is the video of the shooting itself, which was mm -hmm. posted by the by, by the perpetrator. So I suggest it is probably it shouldn't be for public viewing. I mean, nobody needs to see fifty people die in a couple of hours. But but the problem here is is further reaching. So so first, sorry, Dave, but I actually disagree that that I think people are haven't advanced at all from the time when we threw Christians and others into the arena to be eaten by lions. <clears throat> I don't think we've moved on from that at all, not even a little bit. Why do we slow down when there's an accident? Why, why do we rubber watch necking. It? Yes. R rubber necking. We haven't changed. Human beings have not changed. They want to be entertained. Now, if, if the entertainment, I mean, these days we're very clever with the special effects and movies and all these wonderful things, right? So we don't have to watch real life death. We don't have to watch real life uh, um, 
you know, um, what can I say? Um, uh, disasters or, or horrible incidents. We can we can have them uh, created in CGI and watch them. And they're pretty realistic these days, so that that's that's a thing you can do. Um, but but you know, it's, it's we're still the same. We're still the same. If, if technology went away, we would be um, very happy uh, to watch people being torn apart by, uh, well, I don't know, in Australia, but it would be dingoes, I guess, kangaroos, rabid kangaroos, because we don't have any large-scale predators, allegedly. I mean, people say that in Black Panthers some large black dogs out in the bush. Me, that isn't me. Um, in Australia, rabid, um, rabid politicians. Rabid politicians. Don't get me started with that one. Right? <laughs> um, but, but, look, what, what, what happened was appalling, and on a scale that New Zealand hadn't seen, in fact, that we haven't seen in a long time in this in this part of the world. Um, Port Arthur was probably the last uh, um, mm -hmm. incident of this nature of, of, of any anything similar in size. And you all know what I think about Port Arthur. This this one here, what, whatever the final analysis, whatever the result is, I don't want to see. I don't want. I don't want. I don't. I don't want to make the death of these people a public spectacle. No, I, I don't care. I, I I really. I'm not. I'm not that guy, right? But. But by the same token, I guess it's going to give me a lot of hate. Um, the problem, the problem, is not guns. Let me say this again. Mm -hmm. The problem is not guns. If you want to be really smug about it, you say the problem is bullets. And no, but but the the, the, the problem, <laughs> the, the problem is, yeah. the problem is people, mm -hmm. people, people, people. Like let's say let's say for argument's sake here, and I'm not. I haven't, I haven't had time to research this at all yet, but let's say there was this, this lone person who um, who had a, a, a agenda of hate, hates hates Muslims, uh, he, you know. Um, he didn't originally. Started. That was the problem. Yeah, but let's say let's so so he does. That's what he is. So, so you know, and he probably got confirmation biases in his research online and all that stuff. So he he was um, um, you know encouraged in, in carrying out what he did. Um, the, the the ratio of, of shooting to killed points to uh, to a, a, a shooting as, as the media has described it. Port Arthur, if you research this, is completely different. Um, but but here we are. Right? Whether or not the authorities let it happen or whether it happened and in, in, in it actually unfolded the way it did and the way we've been told, it, it, it is it is the problem of the individual. Or or if it were conspiracy, it's the individual of the conspirators. Be the government or other players, it doesn't really matter. Um, do you know what I mean? He, yeah, I looked at you right. He, he thought he was so, he was so right in it. It's, I don't think it's, 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 I think it's an ethical or moral thing. Mm -hmm. But what this is, it's, this has been raised by a lot of commentators across the globe now. Um, this, this is about the survival of the white race. Um, this is, this is what the uh, catchphrase is here: survival. Or, or extinction, as you, if you will, mm -hmm. of the of the white race. Now you've heard me say this before, and I'll say it again. In, in a couple of hundred years, if things are going away, there we're all going to be beige. I got no issue with that. Mm -hmm. We're all going to be beige. So, so what? So what? I watched the movie Green Book last night with my wife. Oh, um, nice. First, yeah, first time I had seen it, and um, it, it, of course it's a movie. I get it. I'm not stupid. I also watched Mississippi Burning and all those wonderful things. Uh, other movies that were there. But, but fundamentally, we will find a reason to hate each other. I said this last week uh, when, when Dave um, was not here, but I, we will find a reason to hate. Yeah? Rwanda. The, 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 two, the, diff the main difference between the two tribes, the, um, the Tutsis and the Hutus, was height. 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 Now, the wave, as I said last week as well, it distinguished between, uh, you know, I think it was um, color of eyes, green eyes, blue eyes against brown eyes or whatever it might be. We will find a reason to hate each other. We will find a reason to kill each other. It, it, it doesn't take a lot. That, that's our DNA. And this is actually part of what we're talking about today. And this is a nice segue. We're going to talk about giants. Oh, that's a bit uh, not at all related, Mackie. Y yes, it is. It is completely related. Because I contend still, we do not, we do not have the time to grow up into adults. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I, I don't care if you live to 100. Don't care. We don't have the time to grow to uh, to, to grow up into adults, and, and hence we act like children. There's an introduction to, to the show cycle. I don't want to read it out to you now. I will do that later. But my, but the point here is that, that we have never been given the opportunity to, to act or become mature adults and act accordingly. 
and and that is deliberate as well. It's a deliberate thing. And we've spoken about this as well. It's, it's actually astounding. Uh, I'm going to divert for a second here. When I did the research for, for Giants, and, and you've seen it as well, mm -hmm. um, there's, there's so many things that just overlapped, and there's so many other things where we have a little, where we have to make excursion into other areas. The actual the actual research length is 75 pages, a four pages, 75 pages. Um, it's the second longest we've ever had, and it's uh, 30 sorry 40,000 or 41,000 words. Uh, in case you're wondering, there 41,000 words. We're going to share with you over the next few weeks, I think. Um, so it's it's and it's it's really pertinent to to realize that everything, the ancient world, everything comes together, and it it actually reflects on an act like that today. Why did this happen? Because we are children. We are playing at civilization. We are playing at being grown up. Yeah, we are not. We are not. We are we are children. Uh, but look. Um, I, I think you know, banning a web page, well, this is the first time it is, um, which is surprising in, in, in many ways. It's uh, freedom of speech you mentioned earlier, Dave. Um, we've, we've had two people denied access to Australia recently, speakers. Uh, yeah, controversial, 100% controversial, and one of them I don't actually like at all. That's <laughs> Milo, you know what? right? Uh, yeah, he's, he's not my favorite guy, but you know what? He's got an opinion, and you know, the only way we can make any progress in this world is by listening to him and then debating him. It's the same way that we deal with a flat earth. I had to bring it up again, but again, to me, the flat earth probably represents the poster child for everything that's wrong with people's brains. Okay? Everything that is wrong with people's thinking ability is epitomized by the flat earth. Mm -hmm. I have not yet been shown any evidence, and I've asked for it, show me the evidence for it, let's debate it. But the problem is, of course, you can't debate with those guys like you can't debate with, with Milo. I just hope one day that we can, because there are points to be made here. There is an understanding to be reached. It's not about being right. It's about finding what it is, the truth. I don't care who is right or wrong. I really don't. I have no best interest in anything. All I want and have always wanted, and Dave wants it so much as well, and in fact most of the people that you listen to on the station want it, and that's the truth. Yeah. That the, that the informa information is completely impartial, like like electricity, let, let me think, electricity doesn't care how it's being used or in fact if mm -hmm. it is being used. You can use electricity to light a room, that's good, you can heat a room, you can cook your food. These are all good things. You can also kill somebody with electricity. That's mm -hmm. probably bad. So electricity doesn't give a hoot. It is us that make the choice for electricity. Information is the same. There it is. This is the information. There you go. Right? What you do with it is entirely up to you. Mm -hmm. But information in and of itself is completely unbiased. Right? It is just things that are. Things that are. All right? All things that are not. Mm -hmm. Okay? It's, it's, it is that simple. Everybody has an idea. Dave, go ahead. <laughs> yes, sir. you're absolutely right. I, I'm, I'm thinking you're, you're the, that the epitomizing today is the flat earth and that not being able to debate with them because they're not, they've already gone past the point of being a devotee to the well, what, what they're calling facts that support it, that they've lost sight of what made those, what makes a fact. So they're going in blindly, blindly believing with false facts that, that it exists. I have to say that this, I'm just going to talk, say, say something about Milo uh, and, and free speech. Milo himself is doing what our, in the, you know, um, maybe the Americans would call them left-wing comedians slash commentators um, that have their Tonight Shows in the US that stand up and do a bit of comedy. They'll, they'll bag someone out that's on the right. You know, I don't really care. I don't care. No one cares. The comedy is funny. It seems funny. But Milo himself describes himself as a right-wing version of that. But it just seems like everybody thinks that that's really just maybe too awkward 
Now, you may not agree with what he says. I don't agree with what he says and the things that he talks about. He's just not, I'm not the audience for him. But there's no reason to silence him. And there's no reason to silence David Icke. Just because you don't believe what they say doesn't mean that they no longer have a right to say it. And I think that that part of free speech should be upheld until there's only one human left. Because that is the most important thing. Remember at the top of my little talk, I spoke about our moral compasses. Without hearing it, if it makes you cringe, you know it's too far away from your moral compass. If you're happy with it, you know where it sits. It actually cements your, your moral compass in where it is. It's like watching an episode of, of South Park that's, you know, got some cringeworthy things in it. That's a little outside of your comfort zone, but it allows you to still feel comfortable where you are and it draws a line. You're able to draw the line and say, well, I think that stepped over the line, but that's where that goes. You don't say ban it because it stepped over the line because it made you cringe. You, you accept it for what it is. It, it cemented where you are. It made you happier and, and more cozy where you are. Now, if you applaud the death of free speech, you're the idiot. Because in the end, really, what is, what is the government doing by banning free speech, by banning websites that just have people talking to each other, right? What is it really doing? What's the objective? If you're in Venezuela, and you turn off all power everywhere for days and days and days, you're actually limiting the people's ability to congregate because they can't arrange themselves to congregate if Facebook's down and they've got no power. And I believe that was a ploy. The second thing is, if you start to limit your, your people's ability to communicate with each other or see real information, then you can paint anything you want. Now, we know they've been doing that with the controlled media, but now they're doing it with social media, and now they're doing it on the web. So if if this continues, it's no different than putting, you know, that little fence when you walk out of the shopping center, is it like it's a fence there, so you just don't stroll directly off into traffic and die, right? That safety fence there is now no longer filtering the gene pool for stupidity. That little fence there is just... It's allowing everyone, stupid and smart people, the smart people didn't need the fence, the stupid people do, right? To stop the die, they're killing themselves. And all we're going to see is a designer civilization that they're all quite proud, sipping whatever they liked, cognac or champagne, and looking down at the civilization they've created, which are now so inept and incapable of making a decision that they can't vote correctly at the next election, <laughs> right? Because you can just tell them anything and they'll believe it. You can, you can paint their world in any way you want and it just becomes the matrix, but it's a physical matrix where the parameters are, and gear levers are shifted by real people. And the information we know in the media has always been done like this, but once we see AI, Full, maybe it's already fully in effect, but once we see it in control of individuals, then you could turn any person on the planet into whatever you wanted to. Far left, far right, hermit, extrovert. You could see someone um, just like that uh, magician did on his game show. He had a like he had a show where he had like twelve contestants, picked one who didn't like a specific race and he made him a friend he made him by hypnosis turned this guy into seeing the other the race that he didn't like particularly become a friend and he even laid his line his life down to save that guy see what i'm saying so this guy had completely 180 degree turned his morals upside down and did exact opposite and all because he was influenced to do so. Now, you could be, by social media, by the things you're seeing, by confirmation bias, being led down a path against your will, you don't even know what's happening to you. To a point where, well, you might be doing something that you don't know that you're doing. You, didn't, you would never have planned it. 
So this is the danger, right? That's the danger part. But the good part is those little safety gates are up for everyone now in our environment. <laughs> I don't need to see anything bad anymore. I can live my life out in harmony. And Mackie, they take that little part of your brain out and they give it to you in a glass and look, hello. 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 Oh, so, cute. <laughs> so Yes, that's 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 uh, look. I kind of <laughs> that's true, and, and we don't we don't need my control anymore. We we don't need MK Ultra. I mean, we have it and we're using it, and it's it's out there. But uh, Dave, you're right. It's actually not no longer necessary uh, for that to occur, especially with with the generation that grew up with the internet and socially connected all the time, right? Online, always. Mm -hmm. We are on the line all the time. Mm -hmm. On the line all the time. Oh, the Ooh, line. This song, right? We are though, right? And and this this is where where you Dave is co correct. Um, so and and maybe maybe just maybe putting it out there. Maybe MK Ultra ultimately went there. That's what they did yeah, because they're right. real. You know, who needs to abduct people and you know pry their eyes open and pump them full of drugs? That's just silly. We'll just make billions and billions and billions of dollars selling them gadgets they don't need, and uh, pumping them full of information that they can't process. And then you know we are we get all of their information. Because they want to give it to us, because that's how people are. People are morons. And then, if 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 we withdraw them, uh, you know, if, if, we, if we take away some of their social medias where they get withdrawal symptoms, fantastic. So, the, these drugs are much more sophisticated because you get the same kind of withdrawal symptoms that you would get with with a mild narcotic. Mm -hmm. You do anxiety, uh, 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 stress, loneliness. Loneliness, sweats, depression, that, that all says thing. Yeah, if, you, if you take away the device, mm -hmm. that's, that's, it's a bad thing. So social credit is the very next thing to be implemented. Done. done. So, you're behind the eight ball. You saw, you saw yesterday. It's already, <laughs> China is already, China's already there. China is already there. There was an episode on um, the Orville. Do you know the Orville is like a bit of a spoof of uh, Star Trek, except mm -hmm. it's actually much, much better than any of the current Star Trek franchises. Yeah. So it's much more Star Trek than Star Trek. Anyway, <laughs> um, they, they went to, this was last season, they went to a planet, uh, on this planet, it's not like Earth right now, right? So for them, it was sort of a step back in time. Anyway, on this planet, there's this, this uh, worldwide computer system. And what happens is, <laughs> if, if you know, you, everybody has devices and such, and they can all vote on people. So good morning, good morning. It's like an Uber. Everybody is, is in an Uber app, right? And you know, oh, he's a nice person, he's not a nice person. Someone bumps you, you vote them down. Someone uh, spits on you, you vote them down, and on and on it goes. Right? Until you, you get so many negative hits, or so many vote down, so many dislikes, if you will, that you execute it. So the ultimate punishment for being disliked by your fellow people is execution. <laughs> and and if, you, well, if you take this to its logical conclusion, it makes sense. It makes sense. I think it was a, it was a high number of dislikes, right? But if you so, get 50,000, 100,000 yeah. dislikes, well, yeah, you, you should be executed. So the Kardashians <laughs> naturally would become our evolution. Yeah, we, gods. We would, all, we would all turn, yeah, they'd turn into gods. But see, you can only imagine, just like on The Simpsons when they go to that, it's, it's always New Year's Eve. <laughs> kill me now. Please kill me, right? <laughs> Where everyone is fake happy to each other because of the fear of being negative exactly and that exactly. that is not that's not the environment you really want you you want you know um let, let's call it a dead band right so you have that what that means is it's it's a a variation of of a parameter a single parameter like a living parameter of like let's call it happiness so you're not really concerned if you're really happy you're only we only become concerned when you're sad right so if, if, if it's happy and sad is the only thing that's being graphed on a graph and the center line is not happy or sad, you've got a dead band from there up to happy. That top bit is all because you don't care. Happiness doesn't have a downside. It's the negative that does. So that we, we, we would call that a dead band at the top. Um, that's where the figures don't make any, any change to the outcome. What I'm really thinking of here is... Could you imagine how fakely happy everyone would have to be to everyone all the time for them not to be executed? The fear, the fear level would be off the charts, but the happy, the happiness rating would be awesome, right? Because they'll pretend happy. The, it is. It's, it's, it's a per, it is the perfect marriage to the panopticon. Yeah. In, in fact, 
In fact, it is 1984 and Brave New World rolled into one wow. without any coercion. There's no coercion there. Like see, the way society is developing, of course, it was it was it was a satire parody on, on where we're going. That's that's what um, the the show aimed at. Um, it, it it is it is where it's going though. And in fact, there are really negative effects people already experience, as we said earlier, mm -hmm. by not getting likes immediately. So you post something, you're a young person, and you've always been on the line with your device, and you post something on Twitter, Snapchat, or... Listen, or, you're uh, talking to tech. Huh? I'm talking, hey. I'm, 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 I'm knowing my stuff over here. Look at, um, look I've at you, you got a social I've been, man. <laughs> I've been learning myself. But, uh, so, so you do all that, so there's, there's a whole bunch of new things coming out as well, and the Chinese are now heavily into it. Um, but you post something and, and you don't get immediate response. Immediate, I mean immediate, immediate response. Because the, the thing with social media, and that's where a lot of the uh, corporate enterprise apps are going as well, is an immediate gratification. Mm. Uh, I'll give you some example. A service now is killing it in the marketplace because you can see the uh, person typing your answer. So you can see if someone is typing something for you. If you that's see right. that, there's a gratification. Oh, I'm getting a response. Even if it doesn't materialize, the edge is taken off. Someone at least did something, the edge is taken off, right? If I was half smart, I'd write a bot that does it for everybody, right? So it looks like someone's always responding. <laughs> but, but, but the thing is, so, but you, let's say you don't get that. Mm -hmm. So you don't get the response, right? You feel bad, you feel like, and, and now take it to its logical conclusion. Forget the state wanting to execute you. If, if you are so in that world, if you're so on the line, if you will, so immersed, so immersed in, 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 in this in, in environment that you can no longer see your way out of it and then it doesn't give you what you need. I, I see many suicides. I see I see I see maybe even clinical withdrawal syndrome rather than suicide. But but closed off from from the world, it, it is really yeah, the death box, the phone booth. Uh, uh, actually there's a country recently that, that made uh, you know, euthanasia illegal. Anyway, but um, this is where it's going. And, and forget the state wanting to execute you. If you don't get the social interaction online that you want, then then you will probably, you know, self-select for termination. Yeah. Because no one loves you. I mean, there was this uh, funny ad, Dave, um, about dating and such. And the girl, you know, found this great guy, good looking, clearly a good job, uh, mm -hmm. nice to her. Uh -oh. But he didn't have a Twitter account, no Twitter, no Snapchat, not even Facebook. <laughs> No yeah. MySpace, nothing. It's like he doesn't exist. Why is he? Is he wrong? So all our friends get together. He must be some kind of serial killer. It's, it's just a guy who didn't subscribe to the social media, but clearly finding love for him is almost impossible in this world. Oh, that's now, funny. Just, just a parody, right? I mean, it was, yeah, uh, some, yeah. some, but look, this is where we are. Um, there, there's a couple of things I, I did want to mention, Dave, though, uh, around, around what, we, what we saw this week. Uh, very important things, I, I think. Um, <laughs> Brexit is just <laughs> hobbling along. Hobbling along, that's hilarious. Right. Yuri Geller has said he's going to stop it with his mind. I, I, I'm just <laughs> waiting for that one. Um, uh, the Flat Earthers are organizing an uh, Antarctic <laughs> expedition. I, right. If I win Lotto, I will fund that expedition. I'm going to go. I'm going. It's done. If I win Lotto, if I win, you know, millions of dollars, that's where the money is going. I'm going to the Antarctic with the flat earthers. That's and, what I'm and doing. A, and a GoPro <laughs> each, right? Oh yeah, for, for everyone. Money well spent. Yeah, hundred percent. And, and satellite phones, the whole shebang, right? It's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. going to be a. I, I even, gonna... I even want, I even want the um the, the NASA satellites, the spy satellites, to be in, incorporated oh, into the footage. Totally. And I, watch I, them. <laughs> we're gone. So anyway, we're gone. So so that's that's one thing, right? But there were some other interesting things. There was this one thing um, that that really uh, piqued my interest, and there was a headline um, uh, in SciTech Universe. It's just a, it's, it's a, mm -hmm. it's a web page. It's called uh, "Scientists Have Reversed Time with a Quantum Computer." Blah blah blah. I won't bore you with that. Um, but but I did download the original research paper. It's only fourteen pages. It's called "Error of Time and Its Reversal on IBM Quantum Computer." By uh, G.B. Lesovic, I.A. Sadokovsky, M.V. Saslov, A.V. Lebedev, and V.M. Binokur. So it was actually uh, uh, the Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology in, in uh, collaboration with a whole bunch of others like uh, um, uh, US, U.S. and S its Swiss uh, universities. So there was the uh, Argonne National Laboratory, the University of Chicago, and uh, theoretical physics in Zurich. These, all these uh, worked together. So the conclusion 
of this paper. And I won't bore you with the article. I'll give you the conclusion from the paper itself directly, which is not too bad to, to, to understand, I think, uh, in my opinion. Uh, the paper, though, is very technical. So if, if, you, um, if you have the time and the uh, inclination in, in this kind of math, please go ahead. Uh, so in conclusion, our findings break ground for investigations of time reversal and the backward time flow in real quantum systems. One of the challenging directions to pursue is the time dependence of the reversal complexity n of an evolving quantum state. In our work, we have shown that an isolated d-dimensional quantum particle with quadratic spectrum exhibits a polynomial complexity growth n uh, brackets, uh, and it's a whole formula, uh, blah, 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 blah. Another fundamental question is whether it is possible at all to design a quantum algorithm that would perform time reversal more efficiently than using the one they right have, the elementary gates. So far, our time reversal schemes were scrolling one by one through the state components, but did not exploit a quantum parallelism in its full power. So just, just very quickly, they go, they, they're asking for more funding, yes, but they have found that this is an IBM system they're using, and, and they're using qubits, which are quantum bits, uh, they either exist in an on and off switch, like the normal binary, mm -hmm. or in a quantum state. Mm -hmm. In a quantum state, it's, it's a, it's a, I guess it's a probability state, right? Uh, so everybody understands on and off, right? That's binary. Everyone understands computers and, and, and transistors. It's pretty it's simple stuff. It's the, it's the quantum state in a qubit that makes all the difference, which which means you get your you, you you get your computational analysis without on off or anything in between. You just get it. Your computational value just just arrives. It's just there. It collapses the wave function, and boom, there it is. Um, but what they've done, they have reversed the flow of time in the quantum system. Wow. Now, you will argue with me, and as you should, that you know once you go into the macro systems, all this should fall apart because the, the quantum effects only work on a quantum level. That is true. That's, that's really the fundamental issue with the quantum computer itself. The more qubits we try to line up, the more we move into the macro world, thus negating any quantum effects. Mm -hmm. That is the fundamental issue with the quantum computer. If we can solve that, I'm thinking of maybe having uh, three or four together and then putting them in series with another three or four, but yeah, isolated. Yeah, makes sense, yeah. You know what I mean? So rather than having them in series, they're going to be isolated bits of computational power. Anyway, whatever. But what do I know? But the point is <clears throat> that we have fundamentally, and, and physics has always allowed for this. Physics doesn't give a hoot which way time flows. Um, we, we seem to have been able to reverse the flow of time in this experiment. Now, completely counterintuitive, Dave, right? Mm -hmm. Because the moment you start it, you already had the answer, right? Yeah. yeah. Because uh, <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, go ahead. you already had the answer before you started, but you can't get the answer until you push the button. Uh, all right. What? Yeah, I know. What? That, that's right. It's, it is. A, it's crazy. So, um, so, now, there's this. But, but, there's, but there's, what, 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 that, what that, that led to, that that experiment led to scientists saying that the future and now is the same. Mm. So that time doesn't exist past now. There is no time past now. It is the now is already the future. And that means the future has zero time. The time T equals zero, anything past the future. Does that make sense? But when, when you use that in equations, in physics, it zeroes the equation. In, in our understanding. Because we've already exactly discussed right. this. But in the quantum world, yeah. it goes back yeah. in time. But, but we have already established, I think, in, in the past when we spoke about this in, at length, that neither time nor space are, in fact, a reality. That's or right. they, are, they are a reality as far as our experience is concerned. But if you really drill down on it, and I'm talking about uh, entanglement, mm -hmm. which you know, Einstein calls spooky action, action at, a distance. at a distance, which is completely inexplicable <clears throat> in, our, in like our current state, um, as well as a couple other quantum effects. But so, so we, we looked at it and we said, well, there is no time and there's no space because there can't be. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. In fact, that all we have is the uh, eternal now. Like they've said, everything we have is the eternal now. Um, like, as, as the poet once said, the the, the past is history and the future is a mystery, right? So it's 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 true that we only have the now. But but imagine imagine being able to access all of the nows. Mm. 
in your entire world line, when I talk about a world line, I'm talking about the world line in, in its true physics sense, right? Think of yourself as a worm, you know, um, uh, um, I guess a, a box, book. which was yeah, Einstein's and, version. Yeah. Bingo, yeah, like your worm, because that's that's your true shape, all right? A small worm, bigger worm, then you shrink again until you disappear. But this this worm is is, is what represents us in, in a four dimensional space, if you can if you can visualize it. And there's there's there's, there's, there's sorry, this is this is getting hot and heavy. But there's one other thing, Dave, that we need to quickly mention no, because it was your time starts thing. now. Boom! How about scientists have discovered a DNA, a DNA switch that controls whole body regeneration? Blah, blah, blah. Animal regeneration, right? So Harvard uh, University uncovered the DNA switch that controls genes for whole body regeneration. Many people know that certain animals are able to achieve extraordinary feats of repair, such as salamanders, which grow back legs, or geckos, which can shed their tails to escape predators. We've all seen it. Yep. And then, yeah, they form new ones in just in a couple of months. It doesn't stop there either. Planarian worms, jellyfish, and sea animals take this regeneration to a whole new level and can actually regenerate their entire bodies after being cut in half. How does it work? Uh, you know, after a lot of uh, time and effort was put into gene and DNA research, scientists from Harvard discovered that in certain worms, section of non-coding or junk DNA controls the activation of a particular gene, nicknamed the master control gene. It is actually called early growth response, EGR, which acts like a power switch, which is what controls growth and actually has the ability to turn regeneration on or off. Dr. Manzi Trisavastava, Assistant Professor of Organism, or, or, guess, Organismic and Evolutionary <laughs> Biology at Harvard. I know, right? Organismic. That's so I said that the team uh, was able to decrease the activity of the EGR and find out that if you don't have this gene, nothing will happen. Human benefit. The crucial part of all this research is that humans also carry EGR. We are carriers of EGR. In fact, humans do actually produce it when cells are stressed and in need of repair. For example, when there's a wound, say a cut over time, this will heal the damaged areas and regenerate until it's back to normal. However, it doesn't seem to trigger large-scale regeneration, such as lost things or limb, uh, yeah. fingers or limbs, at this point anyway, right? Now, that's, I just wanted to quickly mm -hmm. share that, because that is just Right? That, that's some hot news right off the press, right? With the, with, with the two minutes left, can you imagine that, you know, you go to hospital or something and they go, look, we're just going to, we're just going to activate the thing and uh, you can just go home. Don't worry about it. Just go home. Right? Yeah, yeah but, but, but <laughs> it's just a flesh wound, right? My arm's <laughs> been cut off. It doesn't matter. When you get home, it'll just start regrowing. It'll take a couple of months, but it'll be fully activated. Yeah, no Spine, worries. Spinal, go spinal cord problems. Don't worry about it. Yes. It's fine. All of that. Horrible, serious brain injuries where you're put into a coma intentionally mm -hmm. so that you can heal faster. Boom. You wake up and yep. you're physically fine again. That's right. 100%. That's the 100%. future. And that's part, and I know Mekki Way brought it up, because that's part of what was turned off. That's part mm. of what was, you know, add that to telomerase, right? And you've you go. got, you've got, longevity for the rest of for eternity until the end of time even though it doesn't exist <laughs> <laughs> yeah so that means i can't book uh, my seat at the cafe at the end the, the restaurant at the end of the universe then well you can you can try good luck try. To i don't know who to call i'll it. come i i i i want a venusian i know it was gargle blaster whatever right. it was I want to go I want the goggle blaster. I do want. <laughs> it's like having your your brain mushed out with two large bricks. Um, so, what a what a week! I don't want too many more of these weeks. Oh, and by the way, um, there's uh, clearly an error in in Mother Nature has forgotten or had a a problem loading autumn. I saw that. <laughs> No, error loading error 404 loading autumn retry cancel right because it's 31 it was 31 and a half degrees today here 31 and a half celsius it was, it was hot yeah and, and way high humidity you know so uh and, and and australia this week two category four cyclones hitting the country at the same time from two different directions In africa too yeah, oh, in Africa, that was just crap. I've never heard of a storm like that in Africa. I mean, maybe I've been living on a rock. 100,000 but... people are displaced there. I know. Are homeless. I know. But, but, I mean, Africa has got a whole bunch of stuff happening, but I've never seen a storm like that hitting Africa. 
like that. I mean, climate refugees, buddy. We're we're someone lucky that go, but climate no. change is a hoax. Climate change is a hoax. It's a, <laughs> it's a it's hoax, I tell you. Perpetrated by the people who want to protect us from the climate. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we don't need bees. Who needs bees? <laughs> bees. Bees, stingers. Bees. I make sure. my I make my own honey. I make my own <laughs> honey. Is what I'm gonna do. There you go. What? <laughs> Nutbags. The people, the people that are around us that live that populate this world. A lot of them are nutbags. I'm sorry. You're dumber than a sack full of hammers. <laughs> okay. It's just insane. <laughs> I don't there's know. music. Yeah, there's the music. All right. Well, we'll see you after the short break. Take the time to donate or go to the toilet, get yourself a drink and come back. Uh, yeah. There'll be questions after the break. <laughs> I think we're back. It's a bit weird, but that's all right. I'll just read us back in, I think. Look... This is David Mackey's Shiny Side Out. You're back with us. Thank you very much for participating. Um, yeah, I've started that. And this is show number 367. 760 and 300. 7, 60 and 300. I was angry. That was good, right? <laughs> Oh, I really got that. I got that from you then. And then the laughter sort of melted that away and I didn't understand anymore. Uh, uh, you that. Um, this uh, being this show uh, arc that we're beginning today is Giants. Well, yeah. It's Giants. part of our high strangeness year. This year will be devoted to high strangeness. And we're looking forward to being able to take you through the journey as well. If you have only started to follow us or you've only begun to listen uh, to to our information that we're putting out, if you're if you're new to Freedom Slips or Facebook or YouTube or wherever it is, Twitter, whatever it is, whatever the medium you're following us through, if someone has sent you this as a, a you know like a video, you should go to listen to this. Well. You should go through our archives so you've got a basis of being able to understand what we're talking about. You should become a member of the archives on freedomslips.com. That's a station that we broadcast through, uh, both terrestrially and through the internet, depending on where you are. You can pick us up on the ISS. And if you could be anywhere in the entire universe and still have the Earth's internet for some reason, reasons, then you'd still be able to keep in touch and keep up to date with what we're talking about. This is um, the, I th what, Mickey, do you say this is the third largest uh, oh, show notes? Second. second largest. Wow. You're really so, in for a treat. The most, yeah, the most show notes we put together was for the flood myths, 100 or to a four pages. This, this year, I didn't, I didn't, honestly, Dave, I didn't think it would get this big. Uh, okay. Well, giants, that seems interesting, you know, um, so let's let's just see where, where that where that leaves us. Um, and then then as you do the thing, you you I want to I want to quickly describe what it is we're doing here. So we're going to look at a hypothesis we're going to we're going to share with you in just a moment, and uh, then we're going to go through some of the mythology of giants. We're going to talk about some of the science. So, you know uh, when when will we reach our physiological limit? What do scientists think? What is our what is how much how how tall can we grow? How big can we be? Right? Mm -hmm. There's going to be talk about that. We're going to talk about uh, you know some. It's going to get fairly dry and scientific. So we try to intersperse it with the mythology because that's the interesting bit. I think nice. that's a bit more. Yeah, a bit more. Like it, it breaks it up a little, so it won't all be dry and boring. Uh, will we get taller? You know, there's this there's a whole bunch of uh, signs. Uh, we're going to tell you uh, what the tallest people are that are acknowledged in the world that we know about. You know, the, but the hard signs will be interspersed throughout. Um, and then we'll talk about HGH, a human growth hormone. Mm -hmm. um, so it's... Um, and we're not talking about Sylvester Stallone. No. And, and then we'll talk about how HGH, in fact, 
uh, is, 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 well, not related to, but, but guess what? Our old friend, the Panil Gland, plays a role here mm. again. No, there's, there's a whole bunch of interesting stuff. It really is interesting. Um, in fact, uh, the, one of the last articles in this, or oh, the last one is probably around page uh, 40, uh, human growth hormone, melatonin, and the pineal gland. This is something I'm going to share with you. Uh, there's, there's a whole bunch of uh, tinfoil head zone uh, stuff interspersed awesome. as well. There's, 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 there's a whole, there's, a, there's stuff, there's lots and lots of stuff. And this will take a while to get through, um, I can assure you. And then uh, we'll also have a couple of uh, excursions. And then there's something I found, which is sort of related, and this is the, in an appendix, and it's called Opening the Third Eye, Powerful Ancient Practices for Activating the Pineal Gland and Expanding Consciousness. That's actually going to make it into our hypothesis paper as well, but I just thought I'd tack it on here because it just came up when I did the research for the giants. Now, um, without further ado, I want to quickly <laughs> give you the hypothesis here that we've put together as far as giants are concerned. What is what is prefacing our show notes, and you can't see it, of course, but mm -hmm. once we get the time to upload it, we will. It's it's a, uh, it's a picture, uh, a Sumerian uh, cuneiform picture, probably four or 5,000 years old. It depicts one of the gods uh, sitting in a throne uh, and then fronted, or I guess in front of him are three human beings. Now, the, the size difference is significant, and uh, the human beings probably come up to his knees, mm. even though he's seated. <laughs> so, uh, the gods in, in ancient times were depicted as being giants, very large, physically. And this is a very, there's nothing else that's amazing about this god, except for his size. That, that There's nothing else. Like, he, he doesn't have any, you know, shininess or any wings. It's just a big human being compared to the, well, toddler-sized humans uh, yeah that's, that's a good comparison yeah right yeah mm -hmm. now this is the hypothesis what if human beings are artificially or otherwise prohibited or inhibited from completing from completing the net, net natural growth and maturity cycle right what if that were the case what if we die prematurely in a state of early adolescence <clears throat> what if the age of 100 years is merely the end of childhood if we were to live longer, <clears throat> would we also continue to grow? We have discussed at length the apparent built-in kill switch that most creatures on this planet have, namely the switching off of telomerase, the enzyme that protects our telomeres. Most critically, during the copying process. We contend, <clears throat> that's the shiny side out, not... not Revolution Radio. Mm. <laughs> the shiny side out contends that most human beings never reach adulthood, which explains many, mm. if not all, facets of the human condition and how we have structured our culture. If all is stripped away, what we're left with is an overblown version of Lord of the Flies. Mm. We are not mature in any sense of the word as a species. Agreed. The Right? The mythology and legends of many different cultures include mythological creatures of human appearance but prodigious size and strength. Giant is the English word commonly used for such beings, derived from one of the most famed examples, the Gigantes or Gigantes of Greek mythology. In various Indo European mythologies, gigantic people also featured um, as a primeval race or primeval races associated with chaos and the wild nature. And they are frequently in conflict with the gods, be they Olympian or Norse. There are also historical stories featuring giants in the Old Testament, perhaps most famously Goliath. Although in such references, the term may simply be used to denote a human of extremely large size and strength. They attributed huge superhuman strength and physical proportions, a long lifespan, and thus a great deal of knowledge as well. Yet they are weak in both morals and imagination. Fairy tales such as Jack and the Beanstalk have formed our modern perception of giants as stupid and violent monsters, frequently said to eat humans, and especially children. However, in some more recent portrayals, like those of Oscar Wilde, the giants are both intelligent and friendly. Dave? Mm, humans to reach physiological limits by 2060. That's in this century. Um, this story, this uh, article is Henry Samuel in Paris uh, from 2007. 
There will be no new sporting world records after 2060, he says, as humans will have reached their physiological limits, says the French, French scientist. The conclusion by experts at France's biomedical and um, epidemiological institute of sport erms um, followed an analysis of 3260 world records set since 1896 the year of the first modern olympia olympics then athletes use 75 percent of their physical ca capacity while today according to the study by the body linked to the french sports ministry they use about 99 percent after looking at five disciplines, athletics, cycling, weightlifting, swimming, and speed skating, the researchers are convinced that the human race will soon hit a brick wall in setting world records. It's the beginning of the end, says Jean-Francois Cédilier uh, Toussaint, head of Hermes related articles. We are reaching the limit in terms of physiological capacities of the human race. The number of the world records being broken has already begun to slow down, he told the newspaper. Liberation. Do you like my exit? One can observe phases Love it. Love it. rich in records at the start of the century and in the 20s, the 50s, 60s, and two sluggish periods corresponding to the two world wars. But since the 70s, the graphs show an inexex inexex oh, hang on, I'll get it. inexorable decline in the number of records beaten, he said. The study takes into account progress in timing methods, clothing, equipment, training methods, and diet. Some sports will reach their limits earlier than others, the study predicted. Athletics will be one of the first to go, but swimming has more room for improvement. Women's pole vaulting has the brightest future in terms of records. Some current records are likely never to be broken, such as the fastest woman's 100 metres set by, you guess it, Florence Griffith Joyner, alias Flojo, unbeaten since 1988 at 10.49 seconds. If my car did that in a quarter mile, I'd be happy. The, the men's 10, uh, sorry, the men's 100 meters can still improve, but it's improbable that a man on two feet will one day run 100 meters in nine seconds, says Mr. Toussaint. By 2027, half of all disciplines will have reached their limit. By 2060, to detect new records in events such as the 100 meter sprint races will have to be measured to thousands of a second. A second. Oh, I, I got a fifth, a third, put my teeth back in. Marathons to a hundredth of a second and weightlifting in grams. Wow. wow. <laughs> even, even then, it will take 50 years to beat a record, he claims. The, the same universal biological rules apply to the Oxford and Cambridge boat race, Mr. Toussaint added. Well, that's going to upset them, isn't it? Upset the uh, tip over the apple cart. He suggested that in the future, records should be less important than the way a race is run and the quality of the sporting contest. Interesting. I think this is really interesting. And I'll tell you why it's interesting, Dave. And the reason we put this article here is just to, to give everybody an understanding of where most people's head is at. Physically, physiologically, human beings will hit a wall. So 20, they, they put 2060 there, it might be 2050, could be 2100, could be 2100, who knows? But the mm -hmm. point is, everybody, everybody seems to agree, and there'll be later, as we go through the show cycle, there'll be other studies that have a similar uh, points of view. We will hit a wall, and that's it for the human race as far as physical development is concerned. We can't get any faster or, or higher or, or better or stronger. It's not going to happen, right? And that, of course, ties in with, with our size, our physical size. We're not going to get any bigger than we are, not taller, not really, you know, and, 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 and therefore everything else follows suit. We will reach the limit of where we can go. And if you take everything as a given, you know, all, all base assumptions are that nothing changes and we are who we are, then that's probably true. That's probably true. But if, if, you, if you subscribe to our hypothesis, 
then absolutely not. If we can increase our lifespans and keep the human body growing, right? Maybe not at the rate of uh, the way it grew in puberty, but then who knows? See, all we know at this at this stage, Dave, we're born and we see an infant. We see an infant grow into an adolescent, right? Into into a pre prepubescent person, uh, uh, if you will. Now the brain is not fully developed yet, but but the body is, is sort of developing up until the age of like 18 to 25, right? You have the different stages: the infant, then you've got the, you know the toddler. Then you've got the you know the, the preschooler and the, the the young you know the young child the, the preteen the teen and each stage has its own markers right the acquisition of speech mm. the ability to walk right all these things come along the way the the development of your uh, uh, sexual identity if you will right so puberty um, and these are all stages. These are all stages that we go through, right? And then we go, and then there are other stages in life. Guess what? There's, when you get older as a woman, there's menopause, where you, the reproductive system shuts down, right? So, so these, these stages, they don't stop as we get older. They just, there are more and more stages. And I contend here, I'm sure, too much uh, criticism, that there are developmental stages ahead of us that we simply don't know about because we haven't lived long enough. Mm. We haven't lived long enough. Let me put it this way: If when when the average human lifespan was let's let's call it thirty years, let's say thirty years, you know, a few thousand years ago, you lived to thirty, that was pretty good. Menopause would be completely unknown. Yeah, you would never know about menopause. What if 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 you know if if you died, let's say again, thirty years is the average lifespan, or even forty, or even fifty, and and if you made it into like you know the ripe old age of, of fifty, like an, like an ancient man, but you would not have seen. The frailty that comes when you're 80 or 90 or even 100, you would not, we just wouldn't have seen that kind of state of a human being. We'd be the, completely blown away by that, right? Yeah. So the loss of hearing, taste, smell, yeah. all of those things that that come with older age, they yeah. would be. You just wouldn't know. You wouldn't yeah. ever have guessed that you would lose those senses. You wouldn't have a clue. So, so that that's my point here. It's by the same token, we have no clue. What lingers beyond, especially if you can halt or even reverse mm -hmm. the aging process. This is really what this is about, right? So, Mackie, if you, if you could, using your example, if we could extend the, uh, you know, say 20 to 40 range to be mm -hmm. 10,000 years long, yeah. then... I wonder what one of those next transitions would be in that period yeah. of time. Yeah. Good yeah, question. right? Good question. Now, we, uh, I've spoken about brain development. So, so our, our physical bodies uh, apparently finish developing uh, earlier than our brains, right? So, so our physical body gets to a point where it's in its prime state, right? That's, that's, pr that's like prime, young, strong. Uh, you get injured, you heal quickly. You know all those wonderful things when you're young, right? We all know what I'm talking about. And then there's the decline of the physical body. The brain, though, keeps developing. In fact, we talk about brain elasticity. We're talking about, you know, the, the, the fluid brain, fluid intelligence. Right. The more you use your brain, the, the, the more likely it is that it will, it will retain its, its structure. It won't decay as much as you might otherwise experience. Mm -hmm. But... Who, who is to say that the brain will not develop even further? I mean, I look at my children, and, and you do the same, I'm sure. Everybody else out there would do it. But you, you see the, the developmental patterns in your child and these, these massive milestones that they, that they have. You know, again, it's, it's the uh, acquisition of speech, the, the, uh, you know, the acquisition of, of reason thinking, the, the ability to understand consequences, and on and on it goes, right? And, and it's, it's an astounding thing. Imagine what our brain would be capable if we let it develop further and mm -hmm. further and weren't cut short by the frailties of old age. I mean, old age is, is a decay of your body, including the brain. But let's imagine that wouldn't happen. What, what if the next, um, maybe the next uh, 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 de developmental milestone would be some kind of um, higher brain power? I, I don't know how else to put it, right? I mean, I have no idea what it would be. I mean, Mate, we look at the... Maybe it extends it. Maybe it extends it to fully quantum, right? Maybe, 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 maybe. Mickey, maybe I've got another one for you. I've got another two. So, uh, could you imagine if suddenly your 
just naturally connected to the Akashic record. Hey. Maybe it tunes up, right? Yeah. Maybe that's yeah. what happens. Mickey, I was, I was going to throw you an example, which I know you're going to love, right? So thinking about it like the mayfly, right? Mm -hmm. So the mayfly yeah. in a day, if you could make it live much longer, maybe it would write Shakespeare. Maybe it would be able maybe. to, to um, you know, start its own internet, right? Yeah. If it could live long yeah. enough to do something, but it doesn't seem it's like Parliament. It's not in power long enough to actually do anything critical. So, <laughs> so see how I did. So, so with as humans, in our context, with the human frame frame of size and measure, this is what we're asking. We're asking. We're pondering the question: What would then be our capabilities? What would yes. get turned on? What? Where is that next part? In, in fact, the funny thing is this. We, we have an inkling of what it might be because we have the legends and the myths mm -hmm. that surround us. We have those, right? They're, they're out there. We know what the giants could do. We know what they couldn't do. We knew. We know what the gods did and couldn't do. When this is again, this is something. In mo most cultures, have have a battle between the titans or giants or and the gods themselves, right? The titans are the elder race, if you will. Um, interestingly, what, what if gods is the developmental stage, which is then followed by titans or vice versa? Yeah. Do you get my, yeah. Do you get my meaning? Yeah. So I, I'm not saying it's actually interesting because, sorry, I have to mention it quickly because we're here, but it's, it's much further down, much further down in, in the, or not much, no, a couple of pages down, it, the Jainism. Uh, mm -hmm. the, so the Jain mythology is, is fascinating. They have... Uh, they have the um, um, our, our history divided into eras, right? They're, they're immensely um, long eras, some of them, right? And and uh, in in the um, in the era of utmost happiness and no sorrow, which is called the Sukama Sukama, um, we grow. The average height of people was six miles, right? And the average lifespan was well, a, a long long time, right? Whereas in the Dukama, which is the ex age of extreme sorrow, uh, which lasts for 21,000 years, we're only two feet tall and we live for 16 to 20 years. Right now we are in the Dukama. I know it's slightly different. We're now in the Dukama, which is the sorrow with very little happiness, the age they call it, and uh, lasts 21,000 years. And we are about six feet tall and we live to 130 years maximum. That's got my Just chicken. a Right now, I find it interesting that I mean we're not the first people, and I would never, you know, presume that we were to think along these lines. Obviously, mm -hmm. right? But but let's dive into the mythology. Um, with the way we've structured is um, there's some really interesting stuff. It's actually interspersed from different articles, and I, I put things where they fit. But there's some really interesting overlaps, Dave. Obviously, to a lot of the research we've done in the past and a lot of the shows, like we like we always find. There is no such thing as a single unique topic. There isn't. It doesn't exist. Everything is connected if you allow for it. Right? If you've got your blinkers on, fair enough, off you go. But in truth, all of it, all the things we've brought to you over the last eight years, yeah, eight, eight years, now. <laughs> right, is connected. And, and we hope that the hypothesis, not the one for the giants, but the overall hypothesis, helps you connect it. So, giants, which comes from the Latin and ancient Greek, uh, gigas or cognate uh, giga, are beings of human appearance, but of prodigious size and strength common in the mythology and legends of many different cultures. The word giant, first attested in 1297, was derived from the gigantes, uh, which is Greek, uh, of Greek mythology. In various Indo-European mythologies, Gigantic peoples are featured as primeval creatures associated with chaos and wild nature. And they're frequently in conflict with the gods, be they Olympian, Celtic or Celtic, Hindu or Norse gods. Giants also often play similar roles in the mythologies and folklore of other non-Indo-European peoples, such as in the Narshan traditions. We're going to get to that. 
There are also accounts of giants in the Old Testament. Some of these are called Nephilim, a word often translated as giant, although this translation is not universally accepted. They include Og, king of Bashan, the Nephilim, the Anakim, which are very interesting, and the giants of Egypt mentioned in 1 Chronicles 11, 23. The first mention of the Nephilim is found in Genesis 6, 4. Attributed to them are extraordinary strength and physical proportions. Fairy tales such as Jack the Guy, Giant Killer have formed the modern perception of giants as stupid and violent monsters, sometimes said to eat humans while other giants tend to eat the livestock. The antagonist in Jack and the Beanstalk is often described as a giant. In some more recent portrayals, like those of Jonathan Swift and Roald Dahl, some giants are both intelligent and friendly, Dave. Ancestral giants. Ancestral giants, the myths of various cultures associate giants with primal times. Sometimes giants figure in the creation of the world. North, Norse, sorry, mythology, I should know that, <laughs> uh, uh, says that the first thing to appear out of chaos was the frost giant Mir, father of both giants and people. Abrahamic mythology, which is uh, really the foundation for the Western civilization. Uh, Genesis tells of the Nephilim before and after Noah's flood. According to Genesis 7.23, the Nephilim were destroyed in the flood, but Nephilim are reported after the flood, including the Anakites, the Emites, the Amorites, and the Rephaites or Rephaim. The book of Numbers includes the discouraging report by the spies which Moses sent into Canaan. We can't attack those people. They are, the, they are stronger than we are. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there. The descendants of Anak come from the Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes and we looked the same to them. However, the book of Joshua describing the actual conquest of Canaan in the late generation makes no reference to such people living there. The Bible also tells of Gog and Magog, who later entered European folklore, and of the famous battle between David and the Philistine Goliath. While Goliath is often portrayed as a giant in retellings of the biblical narrative, he is much smaller than other biblical giants. The first century Jewish historian Flavius Josephus and the first to second century BC Dead Sea Scrolls give Goliath's height as four cubits and a span which is approximately two meters, or about six feet, seven inches, so pretty tall fella. The King James translation of the Bible reports the giant Goliath is six cubits of a span in height, about nine feet, nine inches tall, oh. which is over, over 7.25 meters, which is in Samuel 1, 17, 4 in the King James Version. But the Septuagint, the Greek Bible, gives Goliath's height as four cubits in a span, as well, it's about two meters. For comparison, the Anakites are described as making the Israelites seem like grasshoppers. Mm. Who were the Anakim or the Anakites? It sounds for me, Mackie, that's so close to Anunnaki. Isn't uh, it? No, I right? know, right? Yeah. The Anakim or Anakites, and I'll just say Anakim in the future, were a formidable race of giant warlike people. The Deuteronomy um, 2.10 through 21 to 9.2, who occupied the lands of southern Israel near Hebron before the arrival of the Israelites. That's the Joshua 15.13. The Anakim's ancestry has been tracked back to Anak, the son of Arba, in, and this is listed in Joshua 15.13, 21.11 who at the time was regarded as the greatest man amongst the Anakim, Joshua 14, 15. The name Anakin comes, so that's Anakim with an M at the end, most likely means long-necked, i.e. tall. The Hebrews thought them to be descendants of the Nephilim. Makes sense. A powerful race who dominated the pre-flood world, Genesis 6, 4, Numbers 13, 33. 
Now, 33 reference, Mackie. When the 12 Israelite spies returned from exploring the promised land, they gave a frightening report of people great and tall, whom they identified as the sons of Anak. The Israelites seized with fear and believing themselves to be more to so be mere grasshoppers in their sight as a comparison in height. Numbers 13, 33, rebelled against God, Deuteronomy 1, 26 through 28, and refused to enter the land God had promised them. The Israelites were ex exhorted by Moses not to fear the Anakim, but to refuse, but they refused to trust God's promises and as a result, God became angry and prohibited the evil generation, in inverted commas, from entering the promised land. Joshua and Caleb were the only exceptions, Deuteronomy 1, 35 through 36, became uh, because of their fear of the Anakim and their rebellion against God. The children of Israel were forced to wander for another 38 years in the wilderness. That's how scared they were. But, but imagine this, though. I mean, there's your God and says, God, go over there. And they go, no, those guys, they're going to knock us over. But they have God with them. So, again, the Old Testament for me, and I got a lot of hate for this, whatever, is full of references to, to, to people or personages or groups of people which are anything but the God as we see God mm -hmm. today, like mm -hmm. the, the almost uh, abstract term of reference for a godlike being. This god tells his people to go somewhere. They go, no, those guys are gonna go out. They're gonna knock our block off. Are you nuts? And then God says, hey, what you doing? I'm, I'm gonna charge you. So he, he can't even make them go. He's no. angry they're not going. So clearly, clearly he or the group of that pretended or well, production yeah. say pretend mm -hmm. that there was uh, there was meant to be God there, wanted them there for a reason, which in my opinion was probably to kill or displace the Anakin to get access to something. Mm -hmm. Or maybe just, just, just kill them, maybe. I mean, who knows? Ma because if these are the Anakin... Yeah, go ahead. You can think of that place as an outpost Yeah. Could where be. the giants lived. Maybe they were here for a certain length of time and going to leave anyway. Remember that terrible mm -hmm. John Travolta movie? Yeah, I do. Right? The book, the book itself is actually good. The movie was horrible, but the book is good. And Battlefield it, Earth. It was. Battlefield yeah. Earth. That's right. So it just it basically places you know John Travolta in, in his role uh, as one of those giants, uh, yep. you know, yep. and and I see. Imagine Mackie, if if because remember we can't measure everything by the human time scale. We can't measure everything yes. as you know as in a human context. So if Correct. that if Correct. if if I place the giants being there as an outpost, but they're going to leave. When are they going to leave? Oh, about 38 years' time. But, but you know, you just keep wandering around the desert, keep yourself busy for a while, don't, don't return. It's going to be yours when they've gone, right? It'll be yours. Don't worry about that part. <laughs> Does that make... I mean, that describes it in a way that, that I'm comfortable with how it was written in the Bible because they didn't have that kind of talk. No, of course not. Of so, course not. It, 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 but the question then comes as well, right? I mean, who is who here, right? So yeah. let's say they're the Anunnaki. Let's say they're the Anunnaki. Does that mean that the, 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 the because it was actually Yahweh Elohim that they're referring to here, or even uh, Adonai, as, as the Greek translation was, which is a group of people. So was, yeah. were, the, were these the Igigi, or were they a group completely unrelated to the Anunnaki altogether that interacted with the human beings here? And these are clearly the children after the flood yes so yeah they, so they're, they're saying they're saying though that these giants maybe they were posted here to make sure that the the post flood thing like this you know to wrap up the project yeah maybe yeah you know, maybe that's what it was that the outpost yeah. so i'll just finish it off during the yeah, please, conquest please. of canaan joshua expelled the anakim from the hill country and caleb finally drove them out of Hebron completely. However, a small remnant found refuge in the cities of Gaza, Gath, and Ash Ashdod. That's in that's written in Joshua eleven twenty two. 
many Bible scholars speculate that the Anakim's descendants were the Philistines, the giants David encountered. That's in 2 Samuel 21, 15 through 22, including Goliath of Gath. That's 1 Samuel 17, 4 through 7. Um, Josephus also described the Amorites as giants in his Antiquities of the Jews, circa 93 AD, indicating that fossil evidence still remained at the time, for which reason they removed their camp to Hebron, and when they had taken it, they slew all of the inhabitants. These are big dudes, right? There were till then left the race of the giants, who had bodies so large and countenances so entirely different from other men that they were surprising to the sight and terrible to the hearing, I mean, like boomingly loud, right? The, maybe they spoke a different language that was frightening too. The bones mm -hmm. of these mm -hmm. men's, uh, men are still shown to this very day, unlike to any credible relations of other men. In Islam, giants known as or Jabiriturat, <laughs> I added some syllables, or Jabiram, um, that's the tyrants or giants, it's a singular Jabar, such as Jalut, the Goliath, are mentioned, as well as, is that a, a, a oh, I can't understand oui. that word. Oui, Ibn Anak. Thank you very much. And... And lastly, the Book of Enoch describes giants as the offspring of watchers and women. And, that's seven and we know, and we, we know that the watchers are the Igigi. We we have established that's right. that. Yeah. Right. That's so, that's what we know. Yes, that's that's not a guess. Now that brings us to to a description of what these all are. So Dave described the uh, sorry the. Um, uh, Anakim, Anakim, very interesting. Anakites. Next are the Emites. Uh, Emites. The Emites, or Emim, was the Moabite name for the Rephaim. They are described in Deuteronomy chapter 2 as having been a powerful and populous people. They were defeated by the Moabites who occupied the land. The Emim are also mentioned in Genesis 14 5, and according to Rashi, the name is translated as the dreaded ones, Hertz, 1936. And the singular, Emma or Emma, means horror or terror. Mm. The Emims dwelt therein in times past, a people great and many and tall as the Anakim. That's from the Deuteronomy 2.10 to 11, Dave. Take the next one. Okay. The Rephaim, who were they? The word Rephaim, and this is again the same as the Emites, uh, is used in two different ways in Hebrew. It refers to the spirits of the departed dead who dwell in Shoal. It is a poetic description of the dead. It also refers to a strong, tall race of people who lived in Canaan. The second meaning of the word Rephaim is a literal meaning, used to describe actual people who existed. Rephaim was not the description of a person's ethnicity but rather a characteristic that the people of a certain area shared. The word Rephaim means terrible ones, and they're described in the Bible as giants and mighty men. The Rephaim, or Rephites, appear first in a battle with King Chedorlaomer, Genesis 14.5. Chedorlaomer and his allies defeated the Rephaim along with the Zuzim and Emim people. The Rephaim were similar to the Anakim. The Rephaim are mentioned again in Exodus when the Israelites were trying to enter the Promised Land. The Rephaim were living in Canaan and the Israelites were terrified of them. The Israelites didn't want to go into the Promised Land because it was inhabited with giants, the sons of Anak. The spies came back to Israel, as we, said, as we learned earlier, and told the people that the land, though uh, through which uh, we have gone to spy it out, is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people that we saw in it are of great height. And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who come from the Nephilim. And we seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seemed to them. 
The promised land, though beautiful, was inhabited with giants, men so big that the Israelites felt like grasshoppers next to them. The Rephaim were of the same type. That's from the Bible, of course. Can this be taken literally? Who are the Nephilim? The Bible says that Og, king of Bashan, one of the last Rephaim, had a bed that was 13 feet long. That's in Deuteronomy 3.11. Was this just the grandiosity of a king, or did Og really need a bed that large? We know the ancient Jews believed them to be giants because the Greek word titanes, from which English drives the word titan, is used to translate the Hebrew word Rephaim. Ancient folklore from many cultures features story of giants. And there's biblical basis for their existence. The Nephilim, the word used uh, some synonymously with the Anakites, were the offspring of fallen angels and women. Genesis 6, 1-4. How this is biologically possible, we don't know, but the story is, is presented literally. The phrase used in the passage is sons of God, who took daughters of men as their wives and brought children through them. The phrase sons of God is used exclusively elsewhere in scripture to describe angelic beings. If we take these biblical accounts at face value, we see that the Nephilim, the Anakites, and the Rephaim all had three things in common. Great strength, great height, and part angelic or otherworldly parentage. Mm -hmm. Reliable extra biblical historical books like the Book of Enoch, the Book of Jasher, and the writing of the Jewish historian Josephus all also mention the Nephilim, referring to them as mighty men, giants, the sons of an unnatural union between oh. human beings and fallen angels. Oh my goodness. Right there. Becky, right? That, tell, that tells the story. Yep. That's, that's what that does. And once again, <laughs> it solidifies with um, a confirmation bias, what we were thinking. And it's interesting that the term sons of God, the phrase, when you see that and you see it so often, that's what it actually means. The Nephilim. And of, they were offspring from the fallen angels and women. Wow. Okay, so the Armenian mythology this doesn't this isn't just isolated to that part of the world hike hayike was known as the founder of the armenian state was also part of a race of giants who helped construct the tower of babel ancient historian is that movses yes Kor Entasi wrote Hayek was handsome and personable with curly hair, sparkling eyes, and strong arms. Sounds like a man crush. Among the giants, <laughs> he was the bravest and most famous opponent of all who raised their hand to become absolute ruler over the giants and heroes. There you go. Mount Nurmrut is known to have received its name from the Armenian tradition in which Nimrod, there's a name we should all remember, was killed by an arrow shot by Hayek during a massive battle between two rival armies of the giants to the southeast of Lake Van. And, and this, is, this is really important to understand as well. As, as we've said before, and we're going to continue to say until we are blown in the face, the, the, um, the human experience was a lot more rich thousands and thousands of years ago than it was than it is today. I think the human race was divided, not divided, well, had a lot more components to it. There were a lot more separate groups that made up the human family, which no longer exist, or if they do exist, are doing well at hiding from us. Homo sapiens sapiens that has proven the most brutal killing machine ever to uh, roam this planet. For, Every for, once in a while, Mickey, they put a fur suit on and trick us. Right? <laughs> That's what happens. <laughs> forget for, forget Tyrannosaurus Rex, for, forget the Megalodon Shark, forget all that, forget it. We are by far the most brutal 
and deadly species mm. that has ever roamed this planet. Um, interesting though, it's very interesting. And again, we, we, we get these stories elsewhere as well. We get stories of giants, we get stories of ancient tech across the globe. The next one is from the Baltics, the next piece of mythology. According to Baltic mythology, uh, which is the Baltics are obviously um, uh, Lithuania and, and, um, and uh, Latvia and so forth, which, which are you know, sort of between, the Scan between Scandinavia and Russia, there's uh, three, mm. three little countries there. Uh, according to Baltic mythology, the playing of a giantess named Naringa on the seashore formed the Koronian spit. Uh, and Niria or Nerge means land which is uh, diving up and down like a swimmer. This uh, character also appears in other myths, in some of which she's uh, shown as a young, strong woman, similar to a female version of the Greek Heracles. Naringa is also the name of a modern town on that spot. So uh, it was named after her swimming in the seashore, I guess. The next one is Basque mythology. Giants are rough but generally righteous characters of formidable strength living up the hills of the Basque country. Giants stand for the Basque people reluctant to convert to Christianity who decide to stick to the old lifestyle and customs in the forest. Sometimes they hold the secret of ancient techniques and wisdom unknown to the Christians, like in the legend of San Martin. Oh, I can't read that word. Um, tiki. 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 Mm -hmm. While their most outstanding feature is their strength, it follows that in many legends all over the Basque territory, the giants are held accountable for the creation of many stone formations, hills, and ages old megalithic structures, dolmens, which similar explanations provide provided in different spots. However, giants show different variants and forms. They are most frequently referred to as the Gentilic and Muriac, where while as individuals they can be represented as um, Basajon, the, the Lord of the Forests, Samson, developed, sorry, development of the biblical Samson, uh, Erolan, or Erolan, based on the Frankish army general Roland, who fell dead at the Battle of, oh boy, uh, Roncevaux Pass, or even Tartalo, a one-eyed giant akin to the Greek Cyclops. And, that, and, that I, one I, and I've got to say, yeah. Tartalo, Tartar, isn't that... Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's very close. You know, look, you will find it is, it is interesting because the Basque language, as we might remember, if we cast our mind back to a show that we had some years ago, is, is, a, is an uh, island. I it's an island language. Yep. Completely. It has no relation to any other language on the planet. Um, but yes, look, you will find these overlaps a lot. In fact, the, the, um, the image of the one-eyed human Mm -hmm. in gigantic form. This is quite common as well. And, you know, look, I have to say yet again, of course, if we say this, everybody will say we're insane, can't happen, it's crazy, all the experts know it, but there is some, there's an animal called the narwhale. whale, the narwhale. whale. whale. It's, it's a whale which has a single horn. Mm -hmm. It's the horn of a unicorn. We all yeah. know that whales once dwelt on land. That's what evolutionary theory tells us. Mm -hmm. Therefore, there was at one point an animal, which is now a narwhale, whale, that lived on land with the horn of a unicorn. That's right. A long, long time ago. So are unicorns real? Yes. Probably. Yes, they are. Yes. Um, but, but there are other things as well. I mean, this is, this is really the way. Why is it impossible to believe that there is a humanoid that only had the one eye? Be it a, a genetic defect that just was translated and became like an ethnic variable within the gene pool and all the peoples of that nature became that way, like all the peoples of that particular tribe or whatever it is, right? Uh, or horns even, or other things. It, it, we are too narrow in our thinking and we don't have all of the evidence because fossils are notoriously hard to find and they're even harder to form. Anyway, Bulg Bulgarian. This is, um, um, actually, I think my, 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 great, my grandfather came from Bulgaria. 
And in Bulgarian mythology, giants called Ispolini inhabited the earth before modern humans. They lived in the mountains, fed on raw meat, and often fought against dragons. Ispolini were afraid of blackberries, which posed the danger of tripping and dying. So they offered sacrifices to that plant. Now, this is interesting. Do you know why this is interesting, Dave? Because it's it different. gives me very... Yeah, but it gives me a very practical view. You yeah. know what the thing that convinced me in the flat mythology wasn't the similarities, it was the differences. It mm -hmm. was the always the differences. And here, if you are, let's let's say for argument's sake, a giant is 10, 15 feet tall. For argument's sake, right? Taller than a giraffe, taller than an elephant, right? Do you know what happens when an elephant or a giraffe trip? It's not good. Mm -hmm. It's not fun. It's not a good time for anyone. It's certainly not for the elephant or the giraffe. So a giant or a, a human creature that is of gigantic proportions, especially if, if all things being equal, gravity is being what it is, physical laws being what they are, it is not good for a large creature of any kind to fall. Mm. This makes perfect sense. Like, I mean, either someone really thought about this and then made it up, or they're just telling you, well, yeah, that's what happened. If these guys fall down, that's no good because they're just, they have a hard time getting up again. You see, Mickey, unlike all of the other tales who talk about the amazing strength and the physical characteristics which made them awesome and great war machines and they were angry and they, they had a booming voice, right? This doesn't do that. This says, no, you're right. you know, this, uh, we didn't even care about all those things. What we noticed was, was if they fall down, they'd, it's really hard to get back up and it's, it's, it's a bad thing. They'll hurt themselves, a lot of broken bones, you can imagine, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's something else. Yeah. That's Look, one of those that's one of those things. Yeah. That solidifies but we, that we argument. We do know that but, but it does. We we do know that uh, the Brachiosaurus and Bron Brontosaurus, arguably the largest land creatures that ever existed, they were massive. These are the big dinosaurs, right? The big, big dinosaurs, right? Mm -hmm. If you watch Jurassic Park, those are the biggest dinosaurs that you see. Diplodocus. We know now. Yeah, yeah, and, and they have, they have uh, their their breathing holes on top of their head. Now, for the longest time, scientists didn't know why. Now, the, the theory is, and it has been somewhat, uh, uh, I guess, proven through the fossil record where we find their bones, is that they actually spend most of their time in water, because the water gives them enough buoyancy to actually, um, you know, uh, 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 carry their body weight. Because mm -hmm. if I, I mean, if they were always on land. I mean, the joints, you know, they would, would suffer from all kinds of things. But if, you have, if you're underwater, the water carries a large part of your I mean, like a hippo, brain. right? Like a hippo. Like a hippo, exactly, right? So, look, there, there are a lot of things. And then we're going to – we don't have terribly much more uh, for you guys today. But there's a lot of stuff here that just is, is very interesting, especially from uh, – if, if you look at mythology and the converging mythologies across the planet – some of it surely is, is cross-cultural contamination. Other things you think that's not possible. How could it be? But legends of giants are with everyone. And I'm fascinated by the, the North American ones. There's some amazing stories which come next week. The Chinese one. And there's one of recent times... Uh, uh, <laughs> so remember, everyone knows uh, Magellan, Magellan, Ferdinand, Magellan, the, the great, um, the great seafarer. Mm -hmm. Ma Magellan, yeah, I'm sure you all have heard of him. Um, in fact, uh, one of the uh, nebulas, Magellanic uh, cloud, is named after him in the sky. But so he 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 went around uh, in the world looking at things. He went to Patagonia, which is at the the very bottom end of South America, Fireland. It's it's the it's the very last bit of of South America, and he says he saw people that were 12 to 15 feet tall and other explorers also said that so we're going to share that with you next week and in fact francis sir francis drake said that william adams anthony nivet all explorers around uh, the fifth or the 16th century they said all the same thing wow okay so that's uh, actually this is something new i learned when i did the research for this i had no idea about this but you click on a link and all of a sudden, boom, they are, right? <laughs> What's going on? Mm -hmm. um, but this is fascinating stuff. And, and we're going to share that with you 
next week. Um, there's some really, really interesting um, timelines here as well. Hindu mythology is full of it. Jain mythology, which we mentioned as well. We're going to spend some time with Greek mythology. Uh, we're going to look at uh, you know some of the scientific background. We're going to we're going to go through all of the mythology next time. We're also going through some alleged fossil evidence, right? And and uh, and African mythology, it Chinese mythology, it doesn't end. Everybody has giants. Yes. And there's really there's a really interesting book called the Book of Giants, which is an apocryphal Jewish book, and it's part of the Dead Sea Scrolls. I'm telling you. This is a treat. This show is... I, I, I'm having fun. <laughs> I'm having real fun here. Um, but if you're having fun, why don't you donate? Click on the sign of our advertisers. This is listener-funded radio. Neither Dave nor I get paid. None of the other shows, I hope, get paid. <laughs> and we do this <laughs> pro bono, free, yeah. gratis. I don't know, it's funny. And, oh, I thought nobody got paid, man. What? <laughs> so... We do this because we like to, and uh, I like to thank Nighthawk for giving us this platform, because otherwise I'd just be chewing people's off, uh, people's ears off at, at, at a dinner party at the table on the bus on the train. So this, this thank Nighthawk from a fate worse than death. Thank, thank you. <laughs> and um, and look, I know the music's just about to start. If it hasn't already, I'd just like to say um, uh, we hope you've learned something today. I know we did, and uh, stay tuned for next week. And there's the music and uh, we'll see you uh, next week for another shiny side out and stay tuned for a uh, jet pairs jet bears uh, round table show throughout the night take care There we go, there's the end of the show, hitting record, stop.